here is our mission statement. And we're, we've got a really broad mission compared to most uh, advocate organizations. We're not uh, site specific. We cover all cancers. And we actually cover all the stakeholders involved. So we have a, a very um, big website with about 800 pages. We also do trainings um, for professional staff. And that's to help them understand what it's like to be a cancer patient. How do you talk to cancer patients? How do you help them make decisions? So we do a lot of trainings in that area. Uh, we also do training for advocates, uh, like we're doing today. Um, I also do trainings out in the community for people who, who really know almost nothing about cancer but want to know something about cancer. So we're, we've got a really broad mission. So learning objectives for today. Hopefully by the end of today's training, you'll better understand what the research process is. People always hear that term research. Well, what does that really mean? So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about clinical trials and what they mean and why they're important. We'll identify some of the barriers to clinical trial enrollment. And um, unfortunately, those barriers are huge. Um, clinical trial accrual is only about 3 to 5%. It's shockingly low, but there's real reasons for that. Um, they're very important reasons. So we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll also help you understand the importance of tissue donation, uh, why tissue is so important, uh, and a little bit at the end about personalized medicine. So here's what we'll here's the training overview. Uh, what that research process is. We start with basic, move into translational. A uh, little tiny bit about drug development, uh, a little bit about how clinical trials fit into that. But the main focus today will be on clinical trials to help you to understand what they are, uh, what the phases are, what the trial designs are, what endpoints mean, uh, the types of clinical trials. It's a huge topic. Um, we can do uh, uh, several trainings around this. So we, we will move through this quickly. So don't be afraid to go back look at our website, uh, look at these slides again. Uh, we'll talk about risks and benefits. Uh, it's one of the reasons why 3 to 5% accrual rate is there. Um, barriers to participation, another reason why 3 to 5% accrual rate is there. With a, with a focus on patient-centered issues, because th this is what I care about. This is the area that, uh, for whatever reason, uh, medical professionals don't have a lot of training in, in patient-centered um, communication strategies. So we provide that for them. Again, tissue donation and the future, which is very exciting, uh, personalized medicine. So let's start with the research process. What does that mean? What does that term mean? Um, if you look at the arrow there, uh, you're moving from left to right, and, and you're starting with basic research. That's when people are at the uh, bench. Uh, it, it's very exploratory. They sometimes don't even know what they're looking at. They're just interested in a certain something, and, and they study that. If they find something, and if it looks interesting and promising, um, they'll move that into translational research. And that includes animal models. And it's usually mice, just because it's cheap. They reproduce fast, um, and they're pretty close to humans. Um, if the new agent or the new idea is positive in the translational animal model, then they'll move into clinical trials. This doesn't happen very often. You have lots and lots of ideas from the bench that never make it into translation. You have lots and lots of animal model ideas that never make it into clinical trials. So the, the farther you get towards a, a clinical trial, the, the faster ideas are dropping off. It's just really tough to get something through this process. Um, epidemiology is, is, is an entirely different topic, um, but I put it in there just so that you know the term. And it's usually going through medical records where you compare cohorts of people. And that's where um, they first found out that cancer was, uh, or smoking was the primary cause of lung cancer. And they compared smokers and non-smokers and found out the smokers were getting lots of lung cancer. So epidemiology is usually looking at uh, medical records, although they can do some randomized clinical trials as well. So again, as we move from left to right, we get closer to people. I'm a visual learner, so almost everything I do, uh, lots of my slides will have images and pictures in them, because that's how I retain information. And 
you could have bullet points up there and you can talk to me all day and I'm not going to understand it. I really need to see pictures. And I, and I know there's other visual learners out there, so all of my trainings and talks have lots of pictures. But essentially, this is what we talked about earlier in the previous slide. You start a bench to uh, the basic research. Somebody's sitting there at the bench and, and working with test tubes. Uh, that was my career before I was diagnosed. I, I spent 25 years uh, at that bench. Um, I moved into translational research at uh, some point in my career, and I began working with animal models. Uh, whenever you're doing preclinical drug development and an idea is promising, it'll move into animal models, and it's con called translational research. And drug development is going on at these two phases, at the, at the bench and um, at the animal model stage. Um, then you move into clinical trials, and if it's successful, you'll move to the bedside. Um, I've got a big circle around clinical trials because if you can see, you don't get from one to four without going through three. You have to go through three. And three is us. Three is you and me. Three is people, people with cancer. So we're part of this research process. You absolutely cannot get to the bedside without going through clinical trials. So that means we are part of this process as a community. Um, and that's an important piece to remember as we go through the talk. So a little bit on drug development. This could also be a whole talk. And it's only going to be two slides. And the purpose is just to show you that it's, it's a broad topic. But everybody, uh, all the stakeholders are involved, um, from government, um, and that includes NCI. Um, they not only do drug development, but they fund a lot of drug development. Um, academic is where a lot of the drug development starts. Um, it's the basic research where some of these best ideas come from. And pharma and biotech, sometimes they don't do as much basic research. They take what the academics have done. Um, once an academic finds a good idea, then they transfer it over with IT transfer tech stuff over to industry. Um, and that's a wonderful partnership because basic researchers are looking at these basic things. And drug, development, uh, drug developers are, are kind of d developing the drug. They've got the manufacturing capability. So all of these people are, are players. Uh, you can see how expensive it is. Um, at the basic and translational, it's, it's costing $335 million just to get that first idea up and running. And if they put it into a clinical trial, it's another. 467 million. It's a whole lot of money and a whole lot of time. This is a real busy slide. And, and don't worry about trying to understand it uh, during this talk. You can go back to it. The only reason it's here is to show you um, where those little pink triangles are. Um, all the while, um, academics and um, industry is working on a new drug. They're having to send in forms and get um, representation from the FDA that they can move forward. So an IND investigational new drug form is submitted, and it has to be approved. Somebody at the FDA is saying, yes, this is a good idea. It looks like it's going to be safe. It looks like it's going to be successful. So we'll give you this IND. And then they move it into clinical studies. If it's successful, then they have to put a new drug application in. So this is really a slide just to show you that the FDA is involved all along um, this process. And industry has to worry about putting these forms in. It takes months for these applications to be approved. So it's, it's part of the drug development process. Um, and it's just there for your information. So let's go, uh, let's focus on clinical trials now. Let's go a little bit deeper and help you understand what a clinical trial is. Um, if there's anything you take home, if there's anything you want to remember, it's that clinical trials are research studies. They are experiments. They really are. Uh, when something goes into a clinical trial, people don't know if it's going to be as good as, better than, or worse than standard of care. The whole purpose of going into a clinical trial is to find that out. So it's a research study that involves people. Remember that big circle on that uh, graphic. Uh, what they're trying to answer is scientific questions to find better ways to prevent, diagnose, or treat cancer. Doctors don't know 
when it gets out of the uh, translational stage, which treatment is better? Is the standard better, or is this new treatment better? This point is called equipoise. And if you remember the bone marrow transplant um, topic that came up several years ago, where in early phases it looked like it was successful, and advocates got deeply involved and pushed and pushed and pushed and said, everybody should be able to do this if they want to. Insurance companies should be paying for this. And they were successful in making that happen. Unfortunately, it turned out that it really wasn't better. It not only didn't increase survival, but it was very, very toxic for a lot of people. Some people it was very successful for. And that's the way it is with most new agents and most ideas. So it hadn't finished the clinical trial phase three process. People pushed for it early. And that's why this equipoise term is there. We're not quite sure what the answer is. So you really do have to go through phase one, phase two, and phase three. Get it approved, then get it out into people. It's to ensure that people are safe and helped. And that's the whole purpose of a clinical trial. This is a graphic that kind of helps explain why that 3 to 5% accrual rate, why is that so low? Um, it starts out that about 38% of people never even hear about a clinical trial. Their doctors don't tell them about it. They don't know about it when they're diagnosed. They don't, no mention is made. If somebody does talk to them about it, it turns out that about 56% of patients aren't eligible. Um, that's kind of a shocking number. That should be much, much, much lower. Um, eligibility criteria are very strict and very tight. And one of the areas as an advocate that I push for is to loosen those up a bit. We need to drop that number down to 24 or 25. We're losing lots and lots of people because people aren't eligible to get into a clinical trial. And then if you are eligible, about half say no. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And we'll talk about it again. I've got a circle around that because our nonprofit is kind of focused on that specific area. Why do people say no? And what can we do to help? So that's what that slide is about. Um, again, I, I, I like cartoons and images. And, and we just have to go through clinical trials because unfortunately, animal models don't always tell the story. There are thousands and thousands of drugs that were successful in animals and failed clinical trials. Um, it's an award for a cancer cure, but it only works in mice, and, and that's unfortunately the case for most agents, the majority of agents. So why are cancer clinical trials important? Um, because cancer is so prevalent in our society. Uh, one in two men and one in three women will get cancer sometime in their lifetime. And maybe when they're much older, they may die of any thing, some other thing, but lots of people will end up getting cancer. Um, 1,500 people die each day. About one in four deaths are from cancer. So the more people who take part in a clinical trial, and the faster that accrual is, sometimes accrual takes four, five, eight, six years. If we can get it down to two or three years for a new agent and get that out there way quicker, that's a good thing. That's a really good thing. So it asks for the research questions, all the new drugs, all the new surgery techniques, everything has to go through a clinical trial. It's a four-phase process for new agents. Phase one, two, three, and four, and it will always be written this way. It's not in uh, words, it's in these numbers. Um, target therapy is changing this a little bit. Um, there's a new thing called phase zero that's been around for a couple of years now, and it's for targeted therapy, and it's only used for targeted therapy, and that's to see if the drug hits the target. No sense going through all these phases if the drug doesn't hit the target. So finally somebody figured out, well, gee, why don't we do this phase four where we image it. We tag something to the new agent. We see if it hits the target that we think it's going to hit. We image it. We take a picture. Oh, yeah, okay, it's hitting there. Then we put it into phase one. So that's what phase zero is. It's just to see if it hits the target. Uh, adaptive design is, is also changing this phase one, two, three, four, because they're very rigid. They've got very strict criteria on what that means to be a phase one or two. Adaptive design is changing all that. They're, it's very flexible. Um, we'll talk about it a little more later on, um, but if anybody's heard of iSpy2, um, it is an adaptive design, and it's very exciting, and it's, it's 
going to improve clinical trial design a lot if we can use it more often. So here's what phase one is about. The only purpose of a phase one is to find out what dose to give to people. How do you give people a safe dose? It's really tough to find that first number. Um, when I was working in the lab, you start with test tube. You put, um, for, for fungal drugs, you put the fungus in every test tube. And then you put like one milligram of new drug in there, two milligram, three milligram, four milligram. And you find out what number kills the fungus. Once you find that number, then you put it in mice. And you do the same thing. You have some mice with one milligram, some mice with two milligrams, some mice with three milligrams. And you find out what number starts killing the mice. So before you go into people, you take that number that started killing mice, and you go a little bit lower. And you start giving it to people. And it's called dose-limiting toxicity. You have to start somewhere. You have to find out how much drug you can give before you hurt somebody. And that's why phase one is a very risky phase clinical trial to be in. And it always starts with three people. Um, let's say somebody, that first dose is, is, will go back to one milligram. If it doesn't hurt anybody, uh, then those three people are gone from the clinical trial. Three new people come in, and they get two milligrams. And they watch them for three weeks, give it to them every other day or whatever the strategy is. If nobody gets hurt, then those people are gone from the clinical trial, and three new people come in. And they do that until one person has side effects. And if that, say, it happens at five milligrams, then they bring in three more people at five milligrams. And if another person has a side effect, then they drop it lower. So now they know, OK, we're going to start in the clinical trial at four milligrams. So that's what phase one is about, is to find that number that they're going to start using. And it's all done based on how people respond to the drug. So there's only about 15 to 30 people that take part in the phase one. Uh, it's the most risk because no one really receives a dose high enough to help them. If, if they end up at six milligrams, all those people that got one weren't helped, all those people that got two weren't helped, all the way through. Some people, they may have gone as high as seven and found it was hurting people. So those people may have been harmed. So it's, it's a really risky phase to be in. And it's usually only people who have no other options go into a phase one. It usually takes about two years to accrue and to get this data. And it doesn't have to be um, people with the same cancer. So it can be anybody with a cancer. They're just trying to see how much of a drug can they give before people start having side effects. So that's the pur purpose of a phase one. So phase two, they take that number, and let's say it, it was five, and they give everybody five milligrams all through phase two. Um, and they continue to monitor that. And see that the safety and toxicity is OK. So they're still looking at that. But now they're looking to see if there's an endpoint uh, of tumor response rate. Does it shrink the tumor? So there isn't a control group yet. Uh, and all they're trying to do is saying if, it, if it's going to be effective. They don't know if it's going to uh, um, determine overall survival, because all they're trying to do is see if it shrinks the tumor. They don't have enough people to see if it's the power to be beneficial. But they do want to make sure that it shrinks the tumor. So tumor response rate, they're looking at that. There's usually less than 100 people. There's usually three or four centers. And it's to get rid of agents that aren't going to really be beneficial. Uh, it's very, very costly to do a phase three study. So they want to get rid of all the agents early on that aren't going to help people. And this is how they do it. They put it through a phase two and they see if there is a response rate. So if there isn't, um, it's gone. And they're stopping rules in place. They stop it really early, say, no, this isn't helping anybody. Let's stop right here. So they may not even have to bring 100 people in. They may stop at 80 people and say, nobody's benefiting. Um, let's not go any farther. Uh, so it's not really powered to determine if it is beneficial, but it may be. It, it may be. Um, people who are in phase two may benefit. And again, it may take up to two years. So phase three is the big clinical trials. And these are the ones you probably know about and read about. Um, it's the ones that gets published. And in cancer, it's almost always comparing it against standards of care. 
and we'll talk more about what that means. But essentially, it's one arm in the clinical trial is standard of care, and the other arm in the clinical trial is new agents. And endpoints are connected to survival. Um, the studies are randomized, which means some people go into the standard of care and some people go into the new agent. And it really is a comparison. Which one is better? That's that equipoise we talked about earlier. Sometimes they're blinded, um, and the patient doesn't know which one they're getting. They don't know if they're getting the standard of care or the new agent. Um, double blind, the doctor doesn't know as well. And eligibility, um, inclusion, and exclusion become really important here. And we'll talk about that a little more later. It's a large number of people, sometimes thousands, sometimes tens of thousands. So lots of people across the country. So this is the ones where uh, m most people go into, most people hear about. Uh, it's the least risk to participants. And it actually may prove to be better than standard of care. But again, it is a research study. So it could turn out to be the same as standard of care, um, better than standard of care, or worse than standard of care. It's still a research study, and they still really don't know at this point. So phase four is if phase three is what was successful, and they met their endpoint, uh, whatever they said that was going to be, if they met that, and if the FDA says, OK, this sounds like something that is beneficial, not too toxic, then they um, go to the FDA for approval. And then it goes into the general population. But even at that point, um, industry, whoever sponsored that, is still continuing to monitor the side effects. And they're continuing to track effectiveness. Uh, sometimes you'll find subgroups there. And uh, sometimes Avastin is a good case of this. It, it came through phase three and was successful. It met the endpoint. But when it got into the general population with large numbers of people, they saw that overall survival really wasn't there. And the toxicity was higher than they thought. And so phase four is a really, really important phase because it, it, it percolates up all of these things that um, may not have been found in phase three. Um, because you no longer have the strict eligibility, it's a general cancer population. So many more thousands of people are getting it. So phase four is an important piece uh, of the research process. Again, I'm a visual learner, so here's a chart. <laughs> I put everything um, that we just talked about in, in one place, um, added some costs down at the bottom so you can see how really expensive this is. Um, lots of years, lots of money, uh, lots of volunteers. Um, so it's, it's, it's a big process and a timely and costly um, process as well. So there's a summary for you for those people who, who like to print charts. You can go back and, and do that. So let's talk a little bit about study design and what that means. Um, because you may hear that, and it's an important piece. If, as an advocate, you want to know what that study design is. And part of that is eligibility. And we'll talk about that more. Part of that is endpoints, uh, randomization, and we'll go through that. Uh, stratification, and blinding. So we're going to talk about all of that. So what is eligibility? You, you hear that term, and um, what it is is actually two things. It's inclusionary, which these are the things you have to have. To get into this study, you have to have a specific disease type, a specific disease stage. You have to meet certain health status criteria. And that could be uh, blood pressure. It could be. Um, cholesterol levels, there's usually 40 or 50 things that you have to have met because what they're trying to do is they're trying to get the groups, uh, the standard care arm and the new agent arm as close together as possible so that they can really compare what's happening here. So they get everybody as tight and as close as they can. So you have to meet inclusionary criteria and you also have to meet exclusionary criteria. And that means you probably can't have diabetes. You probably can't have a heart condition. There are a whole list of health status criteria that you can't have this, 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 or that. You probably can't have prior treatment because then they don't know which one is really working. You can't be pregnant because they don't want to worry about that. So all of this is eligibility. And it's gotten so tight that 
um, it's hard for people to meet these because people have lots of comorbidities. They have all kinds of stuff going on. And once a drug is approved and you put it in general population, all of that goes to the wayside. So there's all kinds of biostatisticians who are saying, why do we have to have it so tight? You know, once it's approved, it goes to everybody. That's really a better um, comparison when you're, when you're comparing everybody, not this tiny, tiny, tiny little control group of people who match each other. Uh, so there is some, you know, controversy around this. And it's one area where I really push advocates to say, loosen the eligibility a little. And they're beginning to do that. They're beginning to do that. So what are endpoints? Um, it's what you measure, um, an outcome that shows an intervention effectiveness. You have to have the endpoint all written down, all decided. Everybody has to agree this is what the endpoint is going to be. Uh, the primary endpoint is the main focus. If you don't meet that by the end, then that study is not deemed successful. You don't put in for a new drug application. You haven't met the criteria that you set up. So that endpoint um, has to be there. Um, there are secondary endpoints, and they're really important, too. They may be quality of life endpoints. They may be uh, biomarker endpoints. So you know, I always encourage people who are designing studies to put as many secondary uh, endpoints as you can into a study. If you're going to take 10 years and all this money and all these people, then ask as many questions as you can at the same time. Try to get as many answers as you can at the same time. So that's what primary and secondary endpoint are. And here's some specific ones. Uh, there's tumor response rate, and that's almost always just used in phase two. Not so important afterwards. Um, Disease-free survival is the amount of time for patients with local disease before recurrence. So it's important to distinguish between disease-free survival and progression-free survival. Because disease-free survival is people who have local disease. Progression-free disease. Survival is for people with metastatic disease. So it, remember those two. Um, surrogate endpoint it is, is a little bit new and really important and very exciting because finally they're trying, they're finding biomarkers that may correlate with the clinical endpoint. And this is not very far along yet. It's still pretty fuzzy and blurry. But eventually, they may find biomarkers that really do correlate with the clinical endpoint so that they can track somebody, maybe monthly, maybe every six months, um, to see if their cancer is still in remission. Because unfortunately now, um, especially for breast cancer, it grows really slowly. You could be fine, 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 and then go in and, and get an image, and the cancer is back, only it's been back probably for six months or a year, and it's large and it's hard to treat now. Because we don't have any ways to see if it's slowly progressing. So that's what surrogate endpoints are all about. Try to be more sensitive. Try to find it earlier. Try to see um, that change as it happens rather than six months later with, a, with an image, an MRI picture. So progression-free survival, again, is the amount of time in advanced metastatic patients before recurrence. And overall survival is how long a patient lives. And this is always measured from the time somebody goes into the study to the end point. So let's talk a little bit more about progression-free survival and overall survival, because here's where the controversy is. And it's an ongoing controversy. It's been going on for quite a while, and it probably won't end anytime soon. Uh, overall survival is the gold standard for new treatment. And it's time from entry into the trial until death. A very unambiguous. Can't be biased. It's very black and white. You're either alive or you're not. Uh, so that's the gold standard, is what all advocates push for, is let's really focus on developing drugs that increase overall survival. That's an a, a admirable goal. That's what we're all trying to get. The problem is that it requires a large number of patients. You need lots of people to measure this uh, statistically. You need a longer follow-up because you have to follow them all the way through. And remember, breast cancer is a really slow-growing disease. So this is, takes a lot of money. Um, so measuring overall survival, uh, lots of people, a long follow-up, a higher cost. But it is the gold standard, and it is what we absolutely want. 
unfortunately, it can be compounded by two things, by subsequent therapies and by crossover. And by that I mean if, if, if you start, um, say, a clinical trial, let's say that's zero month, and at uh, six months, uh, somebody recurs, and they're not going to just sit there. They're going to have another treatment. And maybe they'll have a third treatment, and maybe they'll have a fourth treatment. And then eventually, maybe they die at, say, year five. So during this period of time, they've had three or four treatments. And it's sometimes hard to tease out, well, did this new agent really help? Or was it a combination of the other things that they had? It's hard to know. Um, this is what industry argues. Um, crossover is another term. And that means when you go into a clinical trial, remember there's two arms, and people have been random, randomized into standard arm, standard of care. Some have been randomized into the new agent. What happens with crossover is no matter which arm you're in, if you progress, you get to go into the other arm. And so when I help people design, I say, always do crossover. Please do crossover. Why would you ask a cancer patient to be in a study where they don't know what they're going to get and not offer them the ability to go to the other arm if they progress? Unfortunately, almost no studies are designed that way. Um, but it is something, as advocates, we can push for. Um, industry will argue that crossover muddies the waters. And it does. It absolutely does. You don't really know. Was it the standard care that helped them? Was it the new agent that helped them? Was it both? It's hard to tease out. But when I talk to biostatisticians, they will always say, all you need to do is increase the number and increase the follow-up time, and you'll, you'll tease that out. They can do it. It just costs a lot of money to do. But it's something as advocates we can push for, uh, crossover. There's another term, progression-free survival. And industry prefers to have that as an endpoint. Um, because it's not really overall survival. It's just that somebody progresses. It's used uh, for second or third degree um, treatment. Or it can be used in accelerated first line. And it's time to progression. When you look at the research comparing progression-free survival and overall survival, they're really, it's very weak. And this tries to say, well, it's a, it's a great marker. If there's long progression free survival, there'll be longer overall survival. Unfortunately, that's not the case. That really isn't true. But um, Dr. Rich Pazder, who's the director of the FDA, is saying, if you've got a metastatic patient and they've run out of options and you've got a drug that will increase the length of time before they progress, then you're giving them longer time with good quality of life. And he's OK with that. So I, this is one of those areas where there's a little bit of a rub between industry, government, and advocates. And as advocates, we're always pushing for the overall survival. But there's a, a lot of industry and government ends up accepting progression-free survival as an endpoint. So it, it's something important to remember. It's something important to say, why can't you push for overall survival? OK. You need more time, OK, you need more people, but let's do it. So that's, as an advocate, one of the places you want to be. So what is randomization, really? Let's, let's get a picture of it again. You know, here, here's a visual picture of what that is. We've talked about the, the two groups. There's the standard of care uh, control group, and there's the new agent group. But what happens if you say, OK, I do want to be in this clinic. They put your name in, they enter you into a computer, and the computer fits you into one of these arms. And that's so that there's no bias. You'll end up in one of these two arms. And that's what randomization is. It's putting you into one of these arms, either the standard of care arm or the new agent arm. And here's the kind. Let's go through specifically. Remember we talked about there's a, there's a bunch of different designs here. The, the usual one is the straight standard of care versus the new agent. Most clinical trials are that. But there's a few new designs out there. Um, one of the new, new designs is that adaptive study that we talked about, the ISPY2. And what happens with that is 
there's three or four or five arms. And it's designed so that as data comes in, you can change the study design. You can drop arms. You can alter doses. You can change which drug comes first. Um, there's all kinds of things. And you have to write that all into the protocol. You have to say, this is, we'll do this. If that happens, we'll do this. If that happens. So it's not so flexible that it's just no rules. But it's much more flexible than standard of care versus new agents. If you get into standard of care versus new agents, you go in, you stay in that arm until the very end of the study, no matter which arm you're in. If you're lucky enough that there's a crossover, at the end of it, you can cross over. Um, but with adaptive, it's changing all of the time. So that's the best uh, of worlds. But it, it's very expensive, and it's very hard to do. And it's based on biomarkers and subgroups. And um, you have to have big agreements between all, all the drug companies, because there's usually two or three drugs involved. And if you're not responding to this drug, let's give you that one. What a, what a great idea. So for a, a patient to be an adaptive to study, that, that's the way to go. Because you know you, people are going to be following you, um, just you. So an add-on, that's, that's another new design type. And it's kind of for targeted treatments that may have to be paired with standard of care to be uh, effective. So in an add-on study, what they do is they combine standard of care plus a new agent. And then the other arm is standard of care plus a placebo. So you're still getting standard of care. If you weren't in the clinical trial, you'd be getting standard of care. But if you go into the clinical trial, you'll get standard of care in the new agent. So that's kind of new. And it's usually just for targeted therapies that need something else besides um, the one agent. Uh, what most people know about clinical trials is placebo. And, and that's an inactive substance. It's a sugar pill. Um, it, it's the kind of word that gets out there and makes people scared about clinical trials. Uh, fortunately, in cancer, almost nobody ever is given a standard of care or is given a placebo. The only time you get a placebo is if um, there is no treatment, no effect for treatment left um, for that stage and type of cancer. And, and, and that's rare. It, it does happen in, in some cancers at some stages, but um, it, it, it's very rare. So mostly, the placebo versus new agent is for things like arthritis drugs or um, some of the things that uh, aren't going to be harmful if you don't get anything. So if your knee hurts a little bit longer and you, because you get in the placebo group, it's not going to really harm you. You're just going to be in pain a little bit longer. So placebos are used in those kind of studies, n not in, in, in cancer studies. Um, this may be changing a little bit with targeted treatment. Um, to see if there's tumor shrinkage. We, remember, we talked a, a little bit about the phase zero. So this is something that is working its way into cancer, um, but it, it won't be ever given in a way that um, standard of care is being denied to people. So observational uh, epidemiology, again, is, is here just so that you know that term. So stratification is a term you may not have heard of. Uh, but it's a really important term, and it's really important in a study that it happen if it can. Um, and what it is, is if a study is going to be randomized, um, then sometimes researchers will stratify first. Um, the easiest explanation is, is to say, um, let's take all smokers and put them in one group. Let's take all non-smokers and put them in another group. And then let's randomize them. So the smokers will get randomized in the standard of care and new agents, and the non-smokers will get standardized or randomized in the standard of care and new agent. Um, it could be a biomarker instead of smoking. And, and that's what you want to do. You want to get people in the tiniest little groups that you can um, and to see what's really uh, causing something. Is the new agent only helping people that smoke, only helping people that don't smoke? You won't know that if they're all mixed in there together. So if you know something about the group, if you have a biomarker of some sort, then you stratify them first. So that's what stratification is. And I think we'll be moving that way much faster as we find more and more biomarkers. Um, we can put people in the subgroups really quickly. Blinding um, is a term. 
uh, if knowing what that agent is might affect the results. Um, some people go in and they'll only go into a clinical trial if they get into a certain group. They want to know what group they're going to get into. The computer's putting them in there. Um, and what happens is people will drop out if they don't get in the group they want to be in. So then they'll blind the study and the, and the person won't know which group they're in. So that's what that, why that's done, is because people have a bias going in. They're saying, nope, I'll, I'll only stay in this clinical trial if I get the new agent. Um, single blind, the doctor knows, but the patient doesn't. And double blind, um, neither the doctor nor the patient knows. So that's what blind is. Uh, informed consent. So if you actually get into a clinical trial, if you want to be in a clinical trial, if you say yes, this sounds interesting, yes, I'm able to do it, yes, I want to do it, um, then you'll be asked to sign informed consent form. Um, and it's important that you really talk with your doctor about this um, because it's the only thing you're going to have um, to understand that clinical trial. So you'll be given this form. Uh, you want to discuss all the issues with your doctor. Um, make sure you ask for comparisons with um, other options uh, that you have, make sure you take the form home. Um, lots of institutions won't even allow you to do that. So push and push and say, you know, I need to take it home. I need to think about it. Um, it took my husband and I, you know, two years to figure out where we're going to move because we looked at everything. How can you ask me to be in a clinical trial in 15 minutes? Um, people need time. So take the, take the form home. Um, also discuss tissue issues. Um, if they're asking you to donate, ask them more about it. And we'll talk about that later in the talk. Um, and then you would sign the form, and then you would be in the clinical trial. So that's what that informed consent document is. It's giving you the options. Um, it's, here's the questions. Um, it, in the document, it tells you why the study is being done. Sometimes it's so technical that you, you, you'll probably want to ask why. You know, explain this to me in, in words that I can understand. Why are you doing this study? Um, what phase is this study? Is it one or two? Maybe you would rethink being in it if it one or two. If it were three, it's, it's much more possible that you'll benefit from it. Now, what are your other options? And please help me understand uh, how they compare. Um, how long will this study last? And what is the study design? Will I be randomized? Is there crossover? These are all questions that you really do want to ask your doctor about. It's in the consent form, but sometimes it's so hard to understand that, um, that it's better to just have some questions that you want answered. Um, are there extra types of tests and visits? Am I going to have two MRIs, three MRIs more than standard of care? Will I have extra biopsies, extra blood tests? And almost assuredly, you will because that's one of the points, that's one of the ways they find out if something is better, is they image it, they get biomarkers, they look at it really closely. So almost always there's extra tests and visits required. Cost is, is also a concern. Probably the drug is paid for, probably all the tests are paid for, but if you have a side effect from one of the drugs, you may have to pay for that yourself. And sometimes it's hard to figure that out from the consent form. So ask. Ask, am I going to be responsible for paying for this? Some states cover it. Some states don't. Some hospitals cover it out of some slush one that they have. Some don't. So it's really important to ask. Um, also ask what the risks and benefits of this are compared to standards of care. Um, talk about confidentiality. How are you protecting me? and my information. Um, confirm that you can drop out. The consent form will absolutely say that you can. But just say, you know, um, I can drop out if, if, I, if I'm not happy with this, right? Um, just confirm that. Um, and then ask for contact information. Make sure you know who to call if you have a problem, if you have a concern, if you have a side effect, if you're not sure what's going on. Um, make sure you get all of that um, if you sign the document. So statistics, let's move to statistics. Um, that's a method used to determine if the effect is real. And there is always a biostatistician that's attached to the clinical trial. Um, some of the key terms that you'll want to know 
is p-value. And you'll see this in the newspaper, you'll hear it on TV. Uh, and what that means really is just the likelihood that the result was due to chance. And that's less than 0 0.05 or 1 in 20. If it hits that, then it's not chance. Because uh, at a certain number, it's just chance. You have to meet this 1 in 20 to be not chance. Be sure that it, that effect was absolutely real. It, it wasn't just chance. So you have to have a p-value of less than 0 0.05. Um, confidence interval is, is a really scientific term. Uh, I, I really wouldn't worry about it. Um, it's here for you if you if you want to know more about it. Um, sample size is important. That is the number of people in the trial, and they'll they'll refer to that as sample size. Um, the sample size is 400. The sample size is 10,000. That's what they mean. That's the number of people in the trial. Um, relative risk and absolute risk. Those are important terms. Um, because absolute risk is the one that's going to be more meaningful for you. So always ask your doctor, is this an absolute risk number you're, you're giving me or a relative risk number you're giving me? And it's the absolute risk number you want to hear. It's important to publish. Um, when clinical trials are done, uh, positive results usually are published, but negative results lots of times aren't published because the researcher doesn't gain anything from it. It doesn't help them. It takes time and money and effort to publish. But without those negative results published, somebody down the street six months later or a year later could do the whole study all over again because he just didn't know that anybody else ever did it. So it's important to say to researchers, make sure you publish your negative results, please. Um, I always ask granting agencies, make sure that you say, Put the results in absolute numbers. Make sure that they publish negative results. Make that a criteria for getting the grant. Um, discuss study results at scientific meetings. Again, this is how community doctors learn what's important, what new changes, what the clinical trial said. Um, it's through word of mouth. It's through publications. It's through scientific meetings. Um, that's how people in the community start changing practice. Here's a few types of clinical trials. There's prevention or lifestyle intervention. There's screening or early detection. Um, those are usually mammography type studies. Um, there's detection and diagnostic tests. And that's, that's when they did digital mammography versus traditional mammography. Um, that's a type of study that was done. Um, there's treatment or new intervention studies. Uh, usually of science, and if you haven't heard that time, that, that term, that means tissue, uh, where they'll take some extra tissue and they'll look for biomarkers. Um, very, very, very important to do. And it's usually uh, tied on as a secondary endpoint to a study. Um, they'll look for chemo drugs will be in the treatment study. Uh, surgical procedures are, are under this category, and, and that would include like um, mastectomy versus lumpectomy. That was all done in a clinical trial, uh, testing different surgical procedures. Uh, radiation falls under there. And again, that's like full breast radiation versus spot radiation. That was all tested in a clinical trial. All of these advances, all of these new things that are here now that weren't here 10 years ago came through this clinical trial process. So everything that we get um, that is better had to come through this. And, and it's it is slow because it involves people and time and money and volunteers. People have to raise their hand and say, OK, I'll do this. Um, quality of life should be attached to every clinical trial. So if you ever get asked uh, about this, uh, make sure that they put it as a secondary endpoint. It's important to know what actually happens. <laughs> it's important to know from the people who actually were in the study. Talk to them. Ask them. Find out. You know, you're losing this huge opportunity if you don't find that out. It matters when you've got three choices and progression-free survival is six months for all of them. It's that quality of life questionnaire that's going to determine sometimes for somebody which one they select. Am I going to be sick the whole time? Am I going to have diarrhea the whole time? Um, all of that matters. So it's important to do quality of life studies. 
protections are in place. Um, safety is first always for everybody, um, starting with the uh, FDA. Um, they look at it really closely. They won't even give you the application to put it through clinical trials if they don't think it's safe. Uh, there's all kind of federal laws to protect people. Um, before a study starts, an institutional review board, and that's made up of researchers and doctors and community members. And they look at the study to say, you know, I don't think we want to do that here. It doesn't look like that's safe for people. Um, unfortunately, this process sometimes slows the, everything down, but it's important to do. It's important to make sure that people are safe. Um, once the study is out, the IRB, again, keeps looking at things. They get a, a every uh, six months or a year, they get a report. They can close the study down. Um, there's something called a data, uh, data safety monitoring board. And they're set up once the study opens, it, it will be this board. And it's at the national level. So remember, um, uh, phase three has thousands of people in maybe 100 sites across the country. So the local site in your community may only may not have any side effects or adverse events, but other people around the country might. So it's the job of the Data Safety Monitoring Board to gather all this data, put it all together. Um, for them, a side effect is called an adverse event, and they look at that and say, you know, this is not looking good. This looks like it's harming people, and they can shut the study down. So that's what their job is to make sure that people in that study are safe. So why would somebody get into a clinical trial? If you don't know whether it's, it's good or better or worse than standard of care, why would you go into one? Um, so for cancer, at minimum, you're going to get standard of care. So you're, you're pretty well protected there. Uh, and also, you may be one of the first to benefit. And if you're metastatic or if you have an aggressive cancer or a rare cancer and there's this new agent out there that people think is helpful, you may be, want to be in that clinical trial to get it first. Um, so lots of people go into it for that reason. Um, some people go into it to help other people um, because it absolutely is going to help um, researchers understand um, whether it's positive or negative, it's going to give them valuable information. So it's a really, really important reason to go into a clinical trial is you, you are going to help people, uh, other people. Uh, you're going to have closer supervision. And for some people, they like that. That extra MRI doesn't bother them. That extra biopsy doesn't bother them. They, they want the doctor to be checking them really closely. And that will happen in a clinical trial. And for some people, they will receive care that they could not otherwise afford. Uh, so those are the benefits of participating. Uh, but what are the risks? Um, the biggest one is that that new agent ends up being worse than standard of care. Th that, that's the worst thing that could happen. Um, or the last bullet down there, that unknown, that could also happen. There could be a side effect that could be dangerous that people just don't know about when they go into it. Um, therapeutic misconception is a term. Most people going into a clinical trial think they're going to get the new agent, think it's going to be better, and think they're going to be helped. Unfortunately, that's not the case. This is a research study, and they just don't know. If, if it all works out well, then it is better. Uh, but it's a risk, and it's important that people know that it's a risk. Um, there is some cost involved, potentially. And there are extra procedures and office visits. So it's important. That's, th these are the reasons why the cool is at 3 to 5%. Um, it's tough. So, so let's move. Um, that was the bulk of the training on what clinical trials are. But I also want you to understand a little bit about the patient-centered issues of why a cool is so, so slow and so tough. Um, and this is, as an advocate, you, you will want to understand this. Because when you talk to people about clinical trials, uh, it, it, it's not our job to sell clinical trials. It's our job to educate people about their importance and what they are. That they're critically important, but every person needs to make up that, that choice themselves. And here are some of the reasons why it's so tough. 
for providers. It's just because they're afraid that they're going to lose control of the patient. Um, that they go to a cancer center and it won't be in the community anymore and they'll, and they'll lose um, that patient and, and the income that it drives. That's primarily why physicians don't talk to patients about clinical trials. If they're not doing them there at their site, they tend not to talk about it. For patients, it's, they just don't know about them. Most patients don't know about them. I, I you know, was working in research and in um, the labs my whole entire life, but when I was diagnosed, I was so much shock and I was so afraid, I forgot to ask about clinical trials. Honestly, I didn't ask about clinical trials. Even though I knew there was such a thing, I was in great clinical antifungal drug work, um, I was just locked in kind of shock and fear. So I didn't talk about it. Nobody talked to me about it. It, it, was, it became a an, 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 uh, choice for me because I didn't say anything and the doctor didn't say anything. Um, so that's why we talk about it in training. They may not have access to trials because they may be in a rural community. Uh, they may be afraid of risk. Uh, they may have personal obstacles like transportation or getting off of work or, or whatever. Uh, they may have financial concerns. Or for a lot of people, it's just one decision too many. Um, I'm trying to figure this whole thing out. Don't ask me about this because it's just one thing too many. Um, there's also, and this is where, so I think most medical people understand the previous slide. I think they understand a lot of those choices, and they talk about them. But most medical people, uh, especially researchers and people who are consenting patients, don't understand um, the level of emotional, physical, and cognitive overload that people are in. And they don't understand decisional conflict and how that works. Um, they also don't have much training in patient-provider communication. Um, different cultural values, learning styles, low health learners, they, they don't have a lot of training in this. It's a problem. Um, they do have this myth that all patients are the same. Uh, every clinical trial comes with a little script, and the clinical research associate or the research nurse who talks to you about it uh, almost always has this little script, and they will read from it. And whether you are Betty, Sue, Bob, whoever, you get the same script, blah, 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 blah. Um, that's not very helpful because in reality, we are all really complex cultural beings. We have lots of different things going on. I am not the same as Susie, and I am not the same as Patty, and they're not the same as me. So when you give the same script, the same talk to every single person, you're not really meeting their needs. So part of our training as a nonprofit is to help them understand this, help them to, to see ways around this. And so we have a four-hour training on this. Um, again, because I... I'm a visual learner. Um, I put this together, and when I give this training, this is the slide that makes the most sense to clinical research associates and research nurses. Um, I start by saying, patients come into you, and they've just been diagnosed, and they're in shock, and they're afraid. And you hand, this, hand them this really complicated legal-looking form. And you don't give them any handouts. And you haven't had any training on how to talk to them about this. You're not giving them enough time. You may say, OK, you've got 15 minutes or 30 minutes. But you're not giving them enough time. If you don't let them take it home and ask somebody and come back and talk about it, you're not giving them enough time. There's lots of cultural differences. And this is not just ethnicity. We saw on that other slide. It's all kind of things. It's all kind of values. It's all kind of risks. Uh, benefit re relationships. Lots of things are going into here, cultural differences. It, it's not just ethnicity, and that's a, an area that they just haven't figured out yet, that we're all very different. What matters to me may not matter to somebody else. Low health literacy, and, and that just means who in the heck knows what randomization is or equipoise or risk-benefit when they get diagnosed. Those are terms we don't know. And they're using them. They're talking about it like we know what the heck they're saying, and we don't. Um, so our health literacy is really low when, when we got a diagnosis and someone's talking to us about a clinical trial. Uh, we have different learning styles. Again, if 
somebody doesn't give me something to look at, I'm not, not going to be able to say yes. I can't uh, listen to you and say yes. So we have different learning styles. Um, what happens is this comes together as the perfect storm. When that cancer patient walks in, um, it's a perfect storm for them. You, you, there's way too many hurdles to get over. Um, it's the exceptional person that can get through all of that, understand all those things that we've talked about, and say yes. And that's why that 3 to 5% accrual is so shockingly low, um, because staff does not do a good job of, of helping that patient at that time make those decisions and help them understand what's going on. And, and so that's what all of our training is about. But that's, that's what this slide is about, that this is tough for patients, really tough. Um, and, and here's a little bit more on that. And we won't go through it because we're, we're running out of time. But um, there is emotional overload. There's a cancer diagnosis. You're giving them all these other things to think about. Um, and, and they're just overloaded. How in the world can they say yes when they're in this emotional overload? They also have cognitive overload. They're trying to figure this out. What treatment do they want? What's their family concerned about? Are they going to talk to their job, their boss about this? Are they even going to mention it? Are they going to lose their job, lose their insurance? All of that's going on. And then you start talking about risks and benefits and standard of study. And, I mean, it's a whole lot for somebody to process. So this is important. This, this is, so we talk about it here so that you understand why accrual is so low, that this is really tough for people. Um, when I put this together, it surprised me as I did the research that nearly one in five Americans, and that's about 47 million, speak a language other than English at home. There's over 350 languages spoken in the, in the U.S. 12% uh, of the U.S. population is foreign born, so they're, they're probably practicing their cultures and, and language from home. Um, by 2050, the non-Hispanic white population will be 46% of the total U.S. population. We have to learn how to deal with that. Medical personnel have to know how to deal with that. It can't just go on the way it is. We're not meeting people's needs. Over 50 million U.S. residents don't speak the same language as their health care provider. That's a tough hurdle to get over for the medical community, but they've got to figure this out and they've got to do it. So here's a summary. Uh, the decision to participate should be the patient. Uh, informed consent is much more than a signature. It's a process. All the facts must be there. Standards must be compared. Uh, rights have to be explained. Uh, so how do you find a clinical trial? Here it is on the internet. Um, we won't go through this. You can find it on the slides later. But remember, today's standard treatments were yesterday's clinical trial. That's how we get forward. That's how we move forward. So let's talk a little bit about tissue. Um, we need tissue. Uh, it'll help us know more about how to prevent cancer, detect cancer earlier, and diagnose cancer in its subtype. That's all based on, and treat cancer, all based on biomarkers found in tissue. Um, you can donate tissue. Uh, when you have a, a procedure, whether it's a biopsy or a surgical procedure, you can donate tissue then. Uh, you can also donate tissue um, in a clinical trial. And there's also some private tissue banks out there. Coleman has a tissue bank. Uh, Susan, Love, Susan Love has a tissue bank. So there are ways to donate tissue. And it's important to think, to think about that. Um, this is a slide uh, that just says standardization isn't there yet. Uh, tissue is collected, processed, and stored, and analyzed differently in every hospital you go in. So somehow we've got to work that, that, that out as well. And I'm on an NPI committee that's, that's looking at that. So people are talking about it. Uh, confidentiality is really important. If you're thinking about donating tissue, the two key terms you want to remember is identified or de-identified. And identified means the hospital and research center will be able to link the information derived from your tissue back to you. Those numbers, those biomarkers, those values will end up in your medical record. That's loss of confidentiality for you, but it's the only way we move into personalized medicine. If your tissue isn't identified back to you, 
researchers can't track if that biomarker has a result with the out, with your outcome. So they ha they see a biomarker, they see what treatments you have, they look at your outcome, and they can determine if that biomarker is important or not. That's where personalized medicine comes in. But it can't happen unless that tissue data is identified back to you. But it opens the door for confidentiality issues for you because people have it in your medical record. De-identified, they break that link. It doesn't go into your medical record. The tissue uh, data is, some, is with the researchers, and your medical clinical data is with somebody else, and they're, and they're not connected. Safe for you, but the researcher has no idea whether what he finds with these biomarkers matter, because it's not tied to your outcomes at all. So that's a big issue for people. Um, your data is being, your tumor uh, information is being linked to state cancer registries now without even asking you. It's, it's just automatically done. Um, here are some questions for your doctor. Uh, we won't go through that now, but you can come back to this. Um, make sure that you ask these kinds of questions. Um, let's move to the future. And, and really, that is personalized medicine. And what does that mean? Um, that means that that tissue, someone will look at that, they will find genomic differences to help identify people who will have side effects. There could be Sue and there could be Betty. They could have the same stage, they could get the same treatment, and one will have side effects and one won't. And today we don't know who, who will and who won't, but with personalized medicine, with tissue donation, with biomarker studies, we will find that out that will be done. Because one of those people has a biomarker that says, OK, you're going to get a side effect. The other thing that happens is they'll do those same genetic tests, and they will find who will respond to a drug. And right now, we don't know that. That's a responder versus a non-responder. Everybody gets the drug. We know some people respond. We know some people don't. And we don't know why. Biomarkers and personalized medicine will find those people. It's important. You don't want to take six months of a drug that's not going to help you. Um, they'll also find my biomarks to screen, diagnose, treat, and monitor your cancer. And if you look at that image below of, of the zebras, and they all look alike. They got black and white stripes. They look alike to me. But if you get real close, they all are different. So even though our DNA is 99% the same, that 1% makes us different each different genomically from the other. And we have to find those subgroups. We have to find those biomarkers. We have to know what those are. And that's what personalized medicine is. It's predictive. It's preventative. It's preemptive. It's personalized. And it's participatory. So these, those are the P's of personalized medicine. And you can go back and read those. But there's a lot of very exciting things that are happening with personalized medicine. Um, so in the future, when people go in and uh, their surgery tissue goes to the pathologist, they won't just look under a microscope at the morphology. They will get a molecular signature. They will look at biomarkers, and they will treat people accordingly. So that's the future. Um, here's some of the privacy concerns, access to testing. These are all some of the challenges of personalized medicine, and they're real. They have to be talked about. They have to be figured out. These are ethical as well as uh, structural problems that need to be discussed. Um, you can come back and look at these. Um, so let, let's, let's just go through a, a summary. I know I rushed through this last part, but we're getting a little bit late. But in summary, we, we've talked about the four stages of research. Now there's basic, and that's the bench research. There's translational, which is animals. Uh, there's clinical, which is the clinical trials, and there's epidemiology. We've talked about clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three, and four. Phase one is risky. Phase two may be effective. Phase three may be as good as, the same as, or better than. That's the whole purpose of putting them through. And phase four is to monitor uh, safety and effectiveness. We talked a little bit about tissue donation and a little bit about personalized medicine. So thank you very much. I know this went pretty quick, um, but you do have the slides, and you can go back to 
uh, our website, and you can ask questions um, both now and back to Lisa, and she'll get them to me. So thank you so much for this opportunity.